Hello and welcome to a very special episode here on the Hogue Law YouTube channel. For those of you that have been following me for a while, you probably know that one of the things we at least occasionally do on this channel is what we call a post-mortem. And this is where we sit down and we analyze something that we really enjoyed or didn't enjoy and the reasons why we enjoyed or didn't enjoy it. Not too difficult to understand, uh, but we only do it occasionally and on things that really leave a strong impression on us. So I'm very happy to say today we're talking about something that I think is an absolutely fabulous piece of content here in the year 2022, and we're doing it in a very special way. For the very first time, I think on the internet in general, although she might disagree with me, I would like to introduce the world to my darling oldest daughter, Emily Hogue. Emily, how are you doing today? I'm good. Yeah? Are you excited yeah. about this? Is this a fun process for you? Yeah, I love talking about Stranger Things. <laughs> I know you do. I think people have heard me talk about you talking about Stranger Things a lot on my various episodes. So what we're going to do today is we're just going to talk about Stranger Things like we talked about it right after the episodes that we watched together, right? Yeah. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. The one note I would say before all of this, first of all, we're not going to talk about spoilers at the top. If you've seen a post-mortem on this channel before, we just spend about 10 or 15 minutes usually talking about overall impressions without getting into plot elements. So if you haven't seen Stranger Things for, I highly recommend checking it out. Emily, I think you'd back me up on that, right? A hundred, a hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> She's a big, big fan. If you can't tell folks. And in fact, she was trying to get me to increase my score when I gave it a 9.5 out of 10 on Twitter. She's very upset that Maverick scored higher. So we'll, we'll definitely be talking about that, but we're going to be spoiler free for a while. And then we're going to dive into some of the more plot specific, some of the things that work for us maybe didn't work for us. I don't know if there's anything that didn't work for Emily. I don't want to speak for her. Yeah, but well, just... mm, a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to have, or we're going to try to have a good time with it. Obviously, this is something that I think is very important. I love narrative. I love stories. I love chatting about these things with my daughter. So with that as our kickoff here, Emily, what is it that you liked about Stranger Things before we got to season four? Uh, well, it's a very interesting and a unique show, and I think a lot of the characters are very likable and have interesting dynamics when they're thrown together, and that makes for a nice cast, and I think the plots were very strong, and they had good arcs. <laughs> a pl good plots, good arcs, good characters. I think that's great. You, you did miss one of my favorite things in Stranger Things, which is the music. Uh, the, the weird synth beats and use of 80s pop songs. I, I don't know how, if that works for you. You're a little bit younger than I am, obviously. Uh, but do you like the music in Stranger Things? I love the 80s music. It's great. <laughs> we'll definitely be talking about music in connection with Stranger Things 4. Um, so by the time Stranger Things 4 rolls in, you've been caught up on the first three seasons, right? But it's been a while since season three aired. Um, and so what were your thoughts before we started Looking at season four, I know I was a little trepidatious. I get the impression you were not as much as me. Well, I was actually like super nervous because season three, for me at least, was a really good season. Mm -hmm. And I really just didn't want them to screw up the show because I love the show so much. <laughs> and it, they said it was going to be a big season. Mm -hmm. And that concerned me, especially with like the hints to time travel that I was getting a lot of. I didn't want that to be screwed up. Yeah, and we might talk about those uh, specifically with some of the other things that happened in earlier seasons uh, and, and this coming season. Well, let's talk about season four then. You're, you're at least a little nervous. I'm probably more anxious than you because I've seen too many of the things that I love die. Um, so yeah. we're going into season four. We start watching it. We wind up watching the part one, what they call part one, the first seven episodes in like, I can't remember, two or three days. I think. It was two days. Some short period of time. And I, I can recall feeling kind of blown away by it. Um, what were your feelings, your recollections of having watched this thing? And again, I, I would say that this is a month ago. We're basically going to be reflecting here in this postmortem on things that we remember, the things that left the strongest impression on us. Uh, we didn't go through a fourth or fifth time. We've watched the season a few times, folks, uh, just for purposes of this video. But what what left the strongest impression on you from the, the first seven episodes. What did you really like? What should people be excited about? Or, or maybe what didn't work for you? I know there's one plot line in particular uh, that we're not going to spoil, but I know that there was a portion that you didn't like as much as others. 
Yeah. Um, well, I really liked season four. Obviously, it has the usual, like, how Stranger Things starts. So the first few episodes, at least, are kind of, you know, kids having high school problems. Sure. And, but, like, I really liked Eddie immediately. I think he's supposed to be a really likable character, too. He's mm -hmm. really nice and charismatic, and I like that. He's a good character to introduce, and he's fun. And especially with the first seven episodes, like, he's an interesting character to see interact with the main group since he's new and everybody else has had so much time to interact with each other already. Having another character thrown into that is very interesting to watch. And I also like, I forgot what I was going to say. I like, <laughs> that's all right. That happens all the time. That's part of the fun. Yeah. I, Oh, it was the end. I like the end of the first seven episodes. I think they cut it really well and it's a really good place to end that selection of episodes. I don't think you could have properly ended it anywhere else. And having the last two episodes together with those seven episodes, I feel would have, I don't know, muffled how great the first seven are. Right, right. We talked about that pretty extensively, which is it's kind of odd. They take seven episodes and then two episodes in part two. Now, the two episodes in part two are really long, um, but it's, it's a weird place just in terms of numbers. You think you're going to split it into parts that it's going to be relatively equal. And so it splits at five or six, but I tend to agree with you that when they made this selection after episode seven, there's revelations, there's understandings, there's kind of a, a motive and an impetus to go in a specific direction on these plot points that we have told you about, uh, that makes it a good stopping point, even if the cynical business lawyer in me, daughter, says, yeah, they want you to subscribe for another month. They want to make sure that you don't cancel your Netflix. <laughs> um, I still think it was a warranted place to stop. So you like the characters. You love the characters already. You like the interactions with a new character. Let me ask you this. One of the things that was really prominently noted as part of the marketing for this show is that this season would be more horrific, would be more dark. Um, did you find that to be the case? And at any point, was it too much for you? Did you like that direction? Did you prefer the goofiness of season three? How do you feel about that? Okay, well, it was never too dark for me, but very few things are. And um, <laughs> yeah, I, I liked the new special effects that they used. I thought those were really cool. And I don't know if it's drastically darker. Season three obviously has a very bouncy and fun, you know, 80s summer type feel as it should. Yep. But um, I don't think it's drastically darker than season one of Stranger Things. It just okay. kind of felt like Stranger Things to me. And I did like it that it was, I don't know, maybe a little bit darker. Obviously how they start that season leads you to that. But I don't think it's drastically anything completely different from how it was originally. Yeah, that might be true. I mean, there's a little bit more gore, I would say, than other seasons. And there's a little bit more psychological uh, kind of concepts than the earlier seasons where you're generally facing off against, you know, demon dogs or whatever that, while scary, are uh, pretty, pretty noble. There's a lot more kind of going on in between the lines uh, of this season. But I wanted to ask that question because I know some people have raised it with me and said, hey, maybe, maybe it gets to be too much. I didn't find that to be the case either. Uh, on this, but I could certainly imagine certain people, maybe even in our household, <laughs> that, that, wouldn't, <laughs> yeah. that wouldn't love uh, every aspect of this season. Well, you talked about new characters. You talked about loving old characters before the season. Do you feel, once you add in part two, that this was a season that had the characters that you love have good growth arcs, have good character arcs? Uh, were there any issues potentially with split casts and, and different areas that I know uh, maybe came up in our earlier conversations. Yeah, well, um, obviously the entirety of the Hopper situation, as I've grown to call it, um, is at least a wee bit irritating. But the cast was mainly in their, you know, sectioned off groups, which is fine. I like to see those interact. But when they do finally roughly kind of get to interact all collectively <laughs> together, um, you know, kind of, but when they do get to interact together, I always like seeing them all together and relatively sure. happy sometimes. Um, so it's nice. And the character arcs this season, I thought were pretty good, like, well, pretty good, really good. They're always good. But Steve, Steve has one of the best character arcs, in my opinion, at least. I really okay. enjoy watching. And we'll get into specifics there in a second. 
Yeah, I well, I like Steve. He's fun. Okay. <laughs> uh, is Steve Harrington your favorite, or do you have another favorite character? I like Steve, Robin, and Max. Okay. All right. So you 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 like uh, Steve Robin, who was just introduced uh, last year or, or last season. I guess it's three years ago in in real life time to Stranger Things, like six months ago. Yeah. Uh, Stranger Things time, and that that in and of itself has its own issue. I will say this: you do have to suspend your disbelief a little bit that the the kids that you are watching are the ages that they say they are, because obviously the show's been produced uh, for longer than the actual timeline within the narrative. But I think that's okay uh, in general. Uh, so that doesn't bother me too much. I, I also tend to agree that the arcs were strong. I think some of them were a little unsubtle um, and maybe a, a little bit on the nose. But I also agree with you that seeing bigger interactions with the whole cast is great. You get some of those. Uh, sometimes they're a little isolated. Sometimes people are off doing their own thing for extended periods of time. And that can feel a little much. Again, cynical business lawyer guy says, hmm, I wonder if that person wasn't available or signed a contract differently than the other people or, or that kind of thing. Again, bring in the non-narrative to the narrative analysis. I am, I'm committing party fouls here, folks. Uh, but the last thing I wanted to comment on, right, is, is the production value, the production quality. This is pretty well noted now as one of the most expensive TV shows ever made. I think one of the things that really worked for me when we started watching the show was how much of a movie it looked like, how much it looked like there was actual directorial focus compared to other streaming shows. And then you combine that with visual effects, the music choices, and the music choices are huge this season. Um, did, did you find that the same or, or were you uh, a little bit less blown away than I was in terms of how it was looking? I think I was definitely less blown away than you, but that doesn't mean I wasn't. Like, it still looked really, really good. And I really like how season three looks, though, because I really like the bright neon stuff. Sure, the mall. Yeah, I'm, the mall is great. Um, but four, four looks great. They all look great. But four, four I think two especially, um, because obviously everything looks cool and the villains are cool. And, you know, they just throw in really cool looking upside down scenes that just look cool because they do. They do. Right. Yes. I don't think it's a spoiler, folks, to know that the upside down is involved with season four uh, of Stranger Things. But yeah, they really went all out with the visual effects. I think it looks pretty much on par uh, with the summer movie uh, for this particular kind of uh, show. They don't have maybe as many effects as the latest Marvel offering, uh, but what they do show I think is really, really well done. Uh, and then, like I said, the, the music selections, obviously, if you've been following the news at all, Stranger Things 4 vaulted various songs up to the number one list. We will be talking about that in short order. Um, so before we leave everybody off in the non-spoiler uh, world here, and we go into spoilers, we talk about plot specifics, is there anything you want to say to folks that are saying, hey, I'm not sure about this. Uh, would you watch Stranger Things 4 uh, again? I've seen it three times. Yes, I would watch it again. <laughs> and you would say it's got great characters. I would say it's got great visual effects, great production value, great music. Uh, and do you have any issue with the length of the episodes? That's a complaint that I've seen leveled at the season a little bit. Some of the episodes are an hour and a half. The finale is two and a half hours long. Uh, was that okay with you? Did they use that time well? Did you feel that time was wasted at all? Well, I, I, I know this is a complaint of a lot of people that it was too long and it's too like hard to get through because it's supposed to be a show, not a movie. But because I love these characters so much, and I know this is the penultimate season, I really do appreciate how much time they spend on each individual thing. And so no, the episode length doesn't bother me. If anything, it brings me great joy because I get to see those characters for longer. <laughs> I love that, actually. That's one of the defenses I often use for the Hobbit movies, which often get maligned against Lord of the Rings. It's not as good as Lord of the Rings, folks, uh, but I like hanging out with characters. I like hanging out in Middle Earth. So I think that's a great explanation. Folks, you get four thumbs up here from the Hogue family. Watch Stranger Things 4. You won't regret it. I think it's a real return to form for the series. That's what we can say without spoilers. Now you've been warned. I should have a spoiler card. I don't have one. I'm sorry. So we're going to just dive in. You can mark your timer right now as we go through some title cards for the show. So folks are living in California, Emily. Yay. We start out the season with a flashback to Dr. Brenner, which we're going to use 
basically throughout all the episodes with even yeah. some clues baked in there uh, for what the plot's going to be that I wasn't expecting. And then mostly we start out with Eleven writing a very nice letter to Mike about how life is in California. And it does the job, I think, pretty efficiently of bringing you up to speed with where everybody's at, right? That's one of the issues that Stranger Things always has is it doesn't start the next day or anything like that. So you kind of always have this opening montage or beat where it's like, what is everybody up to? What are we doing? Uh, which I personally think is pretty cool because it really does make it feel like a sequel movie of some kind. And they regularly establish that this isn't Stranger Things season four. This is Stranger Things four. And whether that works for you or not is uh, you know up to you. Uh, but what did you think of the opening parts of Hellfire Club? You've talked a little bit about the introduction of Eddie. We also get introduced to a character by the name, I believe it's Chrissy, uh, the cheerleader and her boyfriend, Jason. I'm sure uh, you have some thoughts on Jason oh. as we go along. But what, what do you feel about the Hellfire Club? I, I believe the last plot point really there is that, um, uh, that uh, we get a, a Russian doll in the mail that leads us off onto an entire other section of Stranger Things. Talk to me about the first episode. It's the start of the new season. What are you thinking? Uh, well, I like how it starts because it's like Stranger Things nostalgia, I guess, even though it wasn't that long ago for me, the previous season. But I always like how they start because it's super chill and no one's in direct peril and everyone's relatively happy except <laughs> Will because he never is. Will um, never gets to be happy, does he? No, I mean, never. He doesn't get to be happy this season. No. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see... What happens next season? Uh, I, I'm not going to spoil the, the future seasons, but there are reports that he's going to play a more prominent role as we go into the last season of the, the show. We'll see whether that in, in turn actually happens. But you're absolutely right about Will. Um, so you like everything. You like people being happy. You get happier music. You get some weird, funky rearrangements of California Dreaming. You get this the world's saddest diorama scene. Uh, we're, <laughs> yeah. introduced, we're introduced to Angela, uh, Eleven's quote-unquote friend. Um, yeah, before we get into kind of the Eddie and the Dungeons and Dragons kind of side of things, uh, what, what are you thinking with the Californians? What are you thinking at the top of this? Mr. Fibley deserved better. He did. Mr. Fibley. I couldn't come up with that name, by the way, so I'm glad that you've watched it a couple of times. I oh, just, yeah. That diorama really, really had a problem. I think they do a good job of establishing that Eleven is kind of stuck in Californian hell that uh, she is not having a good time. And at the same time, she's lying to Mike about it, uh, which, okay, it's a little teen drama-y um, for our supernatural science fiction, alternate reality, uh, end of all things kind of show, but that's what makes it fun. It's the combination yeah. of the two things. So with all that established, we also learn what's happening with Mike and Dustin back in Hawkins. And this is where we get introduced to one of your favorite new characters. Uh, and that's Eddie and the the title here, the Hellfire Club, which is, of course, a devil cult, cult bent on bringing demons into Hawkins, right? Obviously, obviously. I mean, what else would it be? <laughs> well, that's part of one of the fun plots of the season, right? Because you weren't around, but there really were notions in the 80s that Dungeons and Dragons, which we know is a dice throwing role playing game, check out Lawyers and Dragons on this channel, uh, is uh, somehow bringing people into like cult like devil worship. Uh, and the season uses that to great effect with especially Eddie's deciding to name his Dungeons and Dragons group, the Hellfire Club, which leans in probably deliberately so based on Eddie's character oh, yeah. that to that notion. Right. So you you like video games, you like board games, you like tabletop role playing games. Like what 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 did you think of this being introduced as a plot point in Stranger Things after they've had, of course, used Dungeons and Dragons for a naming convention in prior seasons? Well, I I obviously like Dungeons and Dragons and your lawyer stream. And hey. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting because I obviously didn't have that notion that that was happening then like at all. So it was incredibly interesting to me to watch unfold. Okay. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good perspective on that because yeah, I, I, I can see what they're doing a little bit earlier, but you're sitting there watching season one or chapter one here of season four. And, and you don't have a notion that we might wind up with Jason giving a speech to like the church and town group later. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like that. I don't know if that's a commentary exactly, but I do like that sound effect. I think we can all 
we can all understand where you're coming from there. I so, hate Jason. So it's a setup episode. We get big long flashbacks. It's it's more than an hour long, uh, and yet we still have time despite some high school antics. We see we hear running up that hill for the first time, I believe, in this episode, yeah. which will turn out to be the theme of season four uh, as we go along. Uh, and I think it was funny because we went to watch it again, the the season again, and obviously running up that hill comes to a certain amount of prominence. Uh, and you didn't remember that Max is listening to that in the first episode. Is that right? I assumed it had been mentioned before because Lucas knew it was Max's favorite song. But I assume I assumed it had been played. I didn't realize it was legitimately played. Yeah, and they do. They do a long section of it while Max is kind of walking around, clearly not present as much as she had been. She's separated from Lucas. She's separated from the group. A number of the group have moved to California. And Max, to me, is the through line of the season, right? Like her story is the best told. Her going through everything that she's going through. Uh, and uh, I, I think you start to get that established a little bit here. She's, she's not all present. Everybody else is kind of whirling around her. And then we get Eddie, his Hellfire Club, Dungeons and Dragons, the basketball game, all of those combining to uh, great effect in a, in a musical montage as Stranger Things will do all season. But at the same time, we also have the start of our plot, right? And I think you mentioned in the non-spoiler version of this that you really like when uh, the early episodes kind of have mostly high school antics, but almost always they have something that goes, hey, this is where we're going to have the monsters, right? Oh, yeah. And here Chrissy goes and frankly, she goes and tries to buy drugs from Eddie. Don't do drugs. Yeah. <laughs> That's you listeners. That's also you, Emily. Uh, and uh, uh, she goes to buy them from Eddie. And this creates a kind of uh, relationship between them that's unexpected. The town doesn't believe for the rest of the plot. Uh, and it means that Eddie gets to go and be there present when Chrissy gets a visitor. Um, a visitor. That's what visitor. we're calling it. Yeah. And we don't know what that means uh, when we watch this episode, but we do know that it's bad because oh, yeah. Chrissy, Chrissy finds herself in what amounts to Nightmare on Elm Street, which is not a series you're familiar with. Nope. Right. So that's not a touch point for you, but the smoke and the Dutch angles and the various things that they do to establish that she's in a dream or in an alternate reality or what have you are all reflective of that movie series. Uh, and then she gets gruesomely murdered. Oh, hers, I feel, was the worst, probably because you didn't know it was coming. But I still feel like her death, after rewatching it again, was the worst in the series. Yeah, I think it is that that surprise element, right? Because you don't know what's going on. And you have Eddie, who will prove to be one of the VIPs of the season, freaking out. Like, oh, yeah. He's watching her catatonic. This guy, who we don't know that well, we're still trying to get a feel for him. Is he really bad? Uh, he, you know, he wears the the jean jackets and he says hellfire and he makes demon noises with his face and, and his hands and all these <laughs> things. Uh, we don't know what his deal is exactly, although they have a very touching kind of uh, drug sale uh, <laughs> in, in, in the forest. Um, he, he's freaking out because the way that we find out that what will eventually be called Vecna kills people this season is that they go catatonic when they're in that dream state. And then when he's real serious, they float into midair and then they basically have their appendages broken before their eyes are gouged out or imploded or whatever happens to them. And as you can imagine, that doesn't look awesome. Um, I mean, it looks cool. Um, <laughs> probably doesn't feel great. Yeah. And and that's what takes us out of the first episode. So we kind of get an update to everything. Eleven's unhappy. Uh, Mike is going to be heading to California. Uh, various folks are doing various things that we would expect from them to be doing basically where we left them at the end of uh, season three. And then also there's an invisible person that makes people hover, cripples them and kills them. And that's that's what directs us into chapter two where we use more Dungeons and Dragons naming conventions to talk about uh, the, the enemy this season, the very first, I think it's the very first, Emily, you can back me up on this, uh, enemy in Stranger Things or monstrous enemy to talk. Yeah. Vegna's got ideas. Vegna's got things to say. Makes them all the more scary. Yeah. What do you think of Vecna's look? Um, like I, I'm alternatively like really impressed and then sometimes there are angles that make him look kind of dopey. 
I mean, am I alone in that? No, that that's fair. That's <laughs> fair. Um, because it is all prosthetics, so you're gonna get some of that. Just but, occasionally. Yeah, but I think he looks really cool, and especially with like the moving, like I don't know, vine things across his body. Super yeah. cool. He's he's a really cool villain, and I think the fact that he talks just makes it worse or scarier, I guess. Yeah, well, he's clearly, like, angry. I mean, one of the things that I really enjoyed about Vecna's portrayal, right until the very end, and we could talk about that in, in, a, in a few, obviously, is that he seems very kind of quiet in his motions. He's very considered in what he does, uh, and he just kind of bristles with anger and animosity in a way that I think is is really cool, right? Like, uh, when we talk about giant smoke spiders or we talk about demon dogs or any of those things, they are scary. They are the unknown, but they aren't actually necessarily directly intimidating, right? Yeah. So I really like what Vecna's doing there. He's got the big old, I think I described it to you, like Resident Evil arm mm -hmm. that he put in front of people's heads. Um, and we get to see him at the end of the last episode. Uh, and and we'll get to see him more as he curses more people because now we have a problem. And so all the kids that were otherwise kind of doing their own thing, especially in Hawkins, start to react to Chrissy's dead and, and talking to Max, who lives right near where the death occurred, about what she saw, what she didn't see, um, and getting into describing what's happening here. And they come up with this concept of, as the title of the episode says, Vecna's curse. Vecna being apparently a dark wizard in Dungeons and Dragons. Sorry, folks. I don't know everything about Dungeons and Dragons lore. Um, and the dark wizard kills people. Dustin kind of takes command of the Hawkins crew as Mike goes to California. Uh, yeah. And one of the things I think is interesting about this season is that Mike doesn't have the world's strongest arc. Really, the Californians don't get as much coverage as Eleven and the Hawkins folks. Um, and so Mike um, isn't necessarily the same leadership role in this season as he has been in prior seasons. And Dustin really takes over. Um, do, you, do you like Dustin? Are you a Dustin fan? I like Dustin. I mean, I don't hate any of the characters. <laughs> I, I like Dustin more than Mike, probably. Okay. Yeah, well, Mike has the trouble of being very much stuck in a kind of 11 Mike teenage romance. Um, and that's good. That's important. It's a good foundation for a lot of the interactions, but it also doesn't have as much of the dynamism, I think, as Dustin rolling around talking about, you know, dimensional warp holes and naming things Watergate and uh, trying <laughs> to wreck people. Uh, they have a number of cute scenes in this episode where when they finally discover Eddie, uh, and I apologize if I get any of these episodes wrong, the borders are a little fuzzy because it's a serial uh, storytelling, of course, but I think they discover Eddie. Uh, in the boathouse in this episode. And you basically get these concepts. It's like, oh, yeah, um, this this kind of thing happens all the time. We're going to take care of it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love when they try to fill Eddie in on stuff and Robin's asking questions, too. Yeah, this is the episode. They they do the family video find Reefer Rick thing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They, they Stranger Things, I think, as a series, has always had fun with what I would call kind of adventure game puzzle elements that they, they put into their series. So you have the Christmas lights, you have the drawing of the vines to make the map, you have the code to figure out where the Russians are in the mall. This has one of those where it's, we're gonna use a video uh, computer to figure out where Reefer Rick lives. Um, fortunately, he's a big fan of drug-based movies. So it, he's of type, if he just really loved musicals, they never would have found him. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so they use that. There are other puzzle elements that, that we'll see in the show. And, and in California, I, I believe this is also the episode where we have um, Mike and Eleven and the roller rink. Um, yes. Where they're, they're trying to figure out uh, what's happening with Eleven. Uh, and, and Will is trying to fill Mike in. Uh, and Eleven basically has what I would describe as a carry situation, which, again, is not a touch point for you. Nope. Uh, on, on the roller rink floor. Uh, and her, her plot line in this episode ends kind of weirdly, uh, because she like bludgeons a person with the back of a roller skate to the point where you can see the bone yeah. uh, in the special effects. And, and I say it's weird, not because that's not justified in that plot line at all, 
but it's kind of dismissed, right? That kind of isn't used very much other than to separate Eleven from the group for, for the moment in time that Owens needs to kind of collect her in a future episode. What, what do you think narratively of that plot point? Because I'm a little surprised that something that is framed that seriously doesn't actually wind up doing much of anything. Well, I definitely, it was definitely weird to me when she hit her with the skate and then they were just allowed to go home and everything yeah. was super chill. Like that's, that's weird. Like that's really weird. And that she wasn't like arrested on the spot at yep. the rink. Yep. Um, Cause obviously witnesses, but you yeah. know. <laughs> obviously witnesses. Yeah. I, I tend to think the same way. It's like, would they have gotten to go home? Like if we had seen a scene where they just like had to escape, like, like we're getting out of here before anything happens, but we see them watching things. We see her sitting there while she's getting treated by like the EMTs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we see them go home. And the one thing you always worry about when you're watching a TV show or a movie is like, are they just going to let the character get away with it completely? Right. Yeah. We're not even going to deal with the legal process at all. I think of this with superhero stuff, right? Oh, you, yeah. blew up, you blew up a building or, or what have you, especially for like the, the, the ground floor kind of superheroes that aren't known yet or, or, or that kind of thing. Uh, but I always worry about that. And very often media will just kind of skip it. Yeah. Right? Media, media will go, uh, oh, it's fine. Um, and so they go home. They have a very funny conversation where we get to see Murray uh, who we haven't really been talking about as part of a plot much. I, I guess we'll spin around for Russia in a second. Uh, uh, it's so easy to skip, right? Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and you hear Murray do some funny things because he's a funny character. Skate uh, attacks. Yes, yeah, skate attack, skate attack. Um, and and then the cops come. The cops come and collect 11. Uh, I think the next morning, right, after that. Yeah. Dinner. Um, so that's, that's interesting in of itself. Uh, but... Yeah, I just I, I thought that was odd because I don't know that you needed to escalate it that far in order to kind of get to the same place. But it's clear that they I think they wanted her arrested. Yep. Right. So all this happens. Um, and then we're, we're I think we're I think we're crossing between episodes here. But this is fine to just keep kind of plot consistency. Uh, all this happens. The next morning she's arrested. Joyce and Murray have left toward to go to Alaska where we, we're working on a plot line, which we're probably not going to cover in great depth as we go through our postmortem, because it's neither of our favorites. No. We love David Harbour. We love Hopper. We love Joyce. We we, we, we are okay with Murray. Uh, and yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's kind of its own show uh, where you have a long-form, full-season-long attempt to rescue Hopper and some nefarious Russian agents uh, Yuri is a very funny character and, and he's interesting to follow, but it's entirely separate from everything else. Um, so what you've got in episode two here is you've got Nancy investigating what happened with Chrissy. You have Vecna's second victim. Who I'm going to forget the name of him. Is it Fred? Fred. Awesome. Good job, Rick. Uh, and you have things kind of getting to be problematic in California all while some portion of the cast is dealing with Russia and heading to Russia. And you have various scenes of Hopper uh, being tortured or doing things on a work gang, yeah. generally getting snowed on, so uh, fun. having a bad time of it. And I couldn't tell you which episode that happens in, in any given respect. I yeah. don't know. I don't, I think he's not in one Russian prison and not two Russian prisons. I believe he's in three Russian prisons. It's, it's three different cells in the same Russian prison. Yes. You think it's the same Russian prison. I think well, it's the same Russian prison. At some point, he's tortured, and then he's sent to what, oh. Kamchatka because yeah. they have that like little conversation uh, between the whatever the general and the captain. So the first yeah. one is definitely different, and then the second one could be the same because it's like initial capture, uh, work camp, and then uh, like Demi Gorgon prison. But I guess those probably are the same because they they wind up in the same church. Don't yeah. They? So okay, two prisons. Three cells. Yep. <laughs> uh, and that's what his plot does. And and when it makes sense to us, we'll check in on that. But that's where things are at. They're investigating. Fred dies. Vecna's second victim. Um, and California has escalated to lead us into the monster and the superhero. Where essentially Eleven is arrested, processed, and then picked up by Owens. Paul Reiser, the second director of the Hawkins National Laboratory, uh, who says, uh, we should get you your powers back. 
In case oh, you yeah. didn't recall from any of this, folks that just watched season three, Eleven doesn't have her powers. She can't do anything. She's not a super powered uh, psychic girl uh, at this point in time. So Owens shows up and says, uh, bad things are happening in Hawkins. Um, you realize at that point that he knows more than he's letting on. Yeah, I love his speech. Yeah, he, he says, look, there's there's bad things, uh, but I believe you can save us, right? I, I believe you're the answer to these things. And others believe you're the opposite. Because this episode actually starts out with him being visited by uh, the American Army yep. Black Ops Squad. Like, I, I don't know if they're official or not, because they, they're going to murder some folks in this season. A lot of people they're going to murder a lot of folks this season and they, they meet with Owens. Owens gets the first pictures of Chrissy and Fred being like broken and eyeless. And, and we'll get, we'll get told later on that he realizes what that means. He doesn't really let that on uh, right now in the series. Uh, and then that's what causes him to go in his own black ops crew. Cause he's not working under official orders or anything like that <laughs> to go and collect 11. And so that, that whole skate plot line really results in just, hey, I'm separated from the group and I can get picked up by Owens. And she'll leave a note to Mike that basically says, I, I want to be I want to be a superhero again. Um, and that's that's kind of where the name comes from. Uh, she thinks she's a monster. She wants to be a superhero. We're going to dive into this more deeply as we go through the series with Brenner and everything else. Uh, but uh, that's, that's kind of where things are with uh, what I'd argue is Part of the main plot line, like 11, 11 and her dealings with the scientists uh, and the psychic program is at least half the main plot line. Yeah, I mean, well, am I right there? Yeah, well, Stranger Things doesn't really follow a there's one plot line type thing. It's like there are multiple little groups all doing their own thing that will eventually come together to make yep. the core plot. Yep, that's true. That's true. But I, to me, it's it's Russia's off on the side. Yeah. Uh, Eleven is going to go do her own thing, and she's going to have a very strong singular plot, which is basically her and like the, the co cast that is like the scientists and um, you know who I generally call Tom Riddle, who will eventually <laughs> call Henry um, in her Henry plot. Henry slash Vecna slash one. Whoa! Hey, spoilers on a spoiler zone here. Yes, Henry slash Vecna slash one. What are we calling him? That's a great scene where they all say something different. Um, and uh, she's going to go figure that out. And the Hawkins kids are going to be working through their own issues uh, because it's also in chapter three where you get the lead up to my favorite plot line and maybe my favorite episode of Stranger Things. Yeah. Which is that we're starting to figure out as the investigation is happening that there's somebody named Victor Creel, which is a great kind of campfire serial killer name <laughs> that has had some dealings uh, with uh, issues in the past uh, in Hawkins. Um, and so the team in Hawkins is going to start dealing with it. This also has one of your favorite shots in this in the show, I think, which is Nancy is talking to the police about, oh. uh, about Fred uh, being dead, I think, or, or, or not being findable. And uh, and Steve and company show up. Well, that might, that might be the last episode. So if I miss that, I apologize where Steve and the friends show up and they kind of exchange a glance. Uh, and I, I, I forget how you described this to me, but it was kind of like Nancy says, Oh, we're doing this again or something like that. Yeah. It's no, Steve gives her like a little, like, I don't know, a wave, I guess. And then Nancy like nods. And then it's like, you can totally see on her face. The squad is here. That means there's some supernatural problem. Yeah, that it's oh, it's Stranger Things again. Mm -hmm. uh, and ever since you said that, I've watched that shot a couple times. I'm like, they totally do that there. And I think that's that's what I love about watching things with you um, is that you get those great bits of of insight because that's exactly what happened. Um, and uh, I love that shot. I do think it's the last episode. So sorry, people, for that. But we're we're doing our best. Like I said, it's a post mortem, post a month uh, as we try to put these things together. Uh, and that gets the whole squad together. They start investigating things. Um, and that's going to lead into one of the biggest uh, investigatory moments, which is that Chrissy and Fred were both dealing with nightmares and headaches and nosebleeds. And Max has been shown for the previous couple of episodes to be dealing with the same thing. And she will be in the very poorly lit abandoned high school reading through her counselor's notes when she says, I think I die tomorrow, give or take. 
Uh, and the episode finishes off with what we are seeing now as visions. We've seen them from Fred. We've seen them from Chrissy. Uh, and it's uh, like the world's most evil grandfather clock. Yeah. <laughs> Embedded in the wall. I also think this is the episode that ends, which is the really weird clock noises. If you have it at home, you can listen to the end credit sounds and it's just really weird clock noises that'll come out of various speakers in your surround home uh, sound system and uh, just be freaky. Uh, so that is chapter three, which leads into my favorite episode of Stranger Things, I think maybe ever, uh, which is Dear Billy. Um, and, and episode four here, I think should be nominated for basically everything, but especially Sadie Sink, uh, who plays Max, who is gonna spend the episode essentially um, under under a doom spell, right? She thinks she's dying today. She doesn't think there's anything anybody can do about it uh, because, well, frankly, it's an invisible killer that doesn't ever appear in anybody's uh, line of sight, uh, makes you hover in midair and kills you. Uh, and one of the things I really like about that concept is it seems inevitable, right? Yeah. Uh, as, as Thanos might say, uh, it, it seems inevitable. There's nothing you can do. And so Dear Billy is a reference to a letter that she writes to her brother who died last season in the mall in the finale of, of season three and her grappling with that, but also writing letters to everybody else. And, and this is such a great bit of character because especially at this point, this is going to continue on through the season. Uh, Max is so closed off, right? Max can't talk to other people. Max uh, doesn't know how to express herself. And so she's writing these letters. Uh, and this is going to be one of the big beats at the end of this episode. And it just does such a great job of expressing this kind of anxiety and existential dread. I'm going to die today. Uh, and emotionality that I, I just can't say enough about it. This also features, by the way, one of the best shootouts in television history in terms of how it's filmed and the dynamism of the direction in a plot line that doesn't matter as much as the rest of this stuff, but where the California kids get exercised from the, from the California house and they wind up on the run. An excellent part of this episode in the middle, all these various things happen. And yet all I can talk about is this little girl uh, as she deals with the notion that she's going to die today and interacting with what she thinks is her mom. Did we decide <laughs> that her mom is there or not? I do. So I don't think her mom is there. Like I, it, it's, it's weird because Vecna usually like takes someone who's already there and then like corrupts them when he uh, like puts the other person into a trance. So, oh wow. Nice picture. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if her mom is there or not really. I, I like this episode too, probably not as much as you do. I feel like the whole Max situation gets like kind of smothered by the shootout. Like the shootout is a big thing that also happens. And yeah. I think this part in particular deserved its own episode, maybe just by itself. And I really like the flashbacks that they do. I think that's fun. The flashbacks, the montage, right? So we'll, we'll get there in just a second because there's, there's a couple of things that happen that are really awesome here. So one, uh, you've got Max dealing with all this and that emotionality. And, and I just absolutely love it. I think they just nailed it. And Sadie Sink is amazing. And she's going to be amazing for a long time. You also have Nancy and Robin sneaking into the, um, uh, the asylum um, to go talk to Victor Creel. And you get the first iteration <laughs> of the Creel flashback, right? Yeah. It, and this is one that we're going to revisit. And one of the things that's a theme of Stranger Things 4 is kind of revisiting what you know, the past memories, the perspectives of them. And this is only going to be the first time that we go through what Victor's situation was. He's the perfect, I think it's the 50s family. He and his son and his daughter are moving in uh, and things start to go wrong. And he gives the overall uh, thought process of demon attacks his wife. Um, he winds up unconscious. Uh, his uh, daughter is dead. His son is in a coma and dies. Uh, he tries to gouge out his own eyes. Uh, it's like, it's, it's horrific, right? Yeah. And this, this backstory. And you don't quite know what to do with it at this point in time. Like you, you don't know exactly what's happening with that. But this is being kind of cut simultaneously against 
Max is losing it. Max is now in the fantasy realm. Max is being attacked by uh, Vecna. And I remember watching this episode and thinking they have really set up a situation where I think Max is going to die. Where in general, Stranger Things, if you want to level a criticism at it, is very unwilling to do major damage to the main, especially the kids cast. The teenagers, the billies of the world, certainly whenever Sean Astin appears, that kind of thing. We can do <laughs> damage to those people. But the kids, the kids are, are going to be all right, as they might say. And yet, I'm looking at the situation and it's like, what, what are they going to do? Because they don't appear to have the answer yet. Um, and then essentially Nancy and Robin walk through for the second time, Stranger Things is good at setting these things up, uh, the second time the music room. And we realized that one of the things that Victor Creel had said in his story was that, I think, what is it? He heard the voice of an angel or something. Yeah, an angel was singing. Yeah. Uh, and they are able to, maybe a little leap of logic here, but it's a correct one. They are able to tie that together with the notion that music appears to pierce through Vecna's illusion or mental takeover or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so they run from the, the warden, uh, who, whatever you call somebody in charge of an asylum like that. They run from them uh, and they get the information to Dustin and the crew that are now watching a catatonic Max in front of Billy's grave after one of the better scenes in Stranger Things where she talks to Billy and says, essentially, um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Vecna approaches her and basically says, you wanted him to die, um, where she denies it mostly and like that's a whole kind of psychological thing that'll come up again um and uh they say oh it's it's music they they have a really well cut and edited kind of sequence where they're trying to get the right tape uh into what the what the song is going to be max is taken by vecna she's being strangled and then lo the angel kate bush appears yeah uh, and everybody everywhere is running up that hill yeah um and, and so I am such a big fan of music and I'm such a big fan of music interacting with audio visual elements and, and movies and video games and television. I can't think of a better kind of musical sequence um, in the recent past uh, than this one that ends season four, it's, uh, episode four. It's probably why I like it so much. Um, so, so Kate Bush starts running up that hill relatively quietly. It's pretty chill. Vecna is still being the kind of, pompous villainous ass that he is uh as as a portal opens up where she can now see herself hovering in front of the boys and you get all this really cool uh reaction uh from the guys watching her float in the midair you're starting to have the 80s synth strumming happen in the background uh, and then as vecna basically says there's no hope for you this is the this is the flashback sequence you were talking about right the mod yeah yeah and i think this gives anybody that's at all invested in these characters at all invested in the show in the series uh, that that buzz, that uh, that feeling, that tingle in your body when you when you see this happening with the kind of driving drums and synth chords of running up that hill, and you see this really perfectly edited sequence. They uh, showed the snowball. Come on. <laughs> yes, I should tell folks that you absolutely adore the snowball, which is the epilogue ending of season two, and so the snowball comes into play. Her kiss with Lucas. Um, throwing gummy bears or whatever her yeah. all time with 11. And it's just really impeccably edited until it culminates in like, I think she rips a tendril off of Vecna or something. Yes. Like, like his neck part. <laughs> she rips a tendril off of Vecna and she runs for it. And you get like just full on movie special effects. This is a shot from that run with running up that hill going nuts. And uh, I remember because again, I had kind of thought, Oh, Max could really die here. It's the fourth episode. You could write a contract. Again, I bring all this weird stuff to the table when I want to. <laughs> you could write a contract where it's a four episode kind of deal. Um, and, and she's running. And like, I feel like I'm 10 years old again, where I'm like, yeah, get there. <laughs> I didn't think yeah. she was going to die. I right. didn't. This, is, this, is the, this is the reason why I don't think you react as strongly to this episode as I do, because I finished this. I basically cheer in our basement watching this to a TV show <laughs> and I'm talking to you after the episode. And what does Emily say to me? She says, I didn't think she was going to die. I just didn't. They wouldn't kill the kids. <laughs> I they didn't wouldn't. think she was under any risk. Dad, I don't, 
that's cool. Um, it was well done. Uh, you know, she, she starts talking to me in that slightly condescending way. It's like, look, you know, that was well produced. The music was delightful and everything. But like, honestly, dad, they're not going to kill Max. No. Oh, OK. All right. The other thing I really like about the end of this is that they do a kind of slowed down uh, remix uh, instrumental version of Running Up That Hill in the credits. I highly recommend watching the Stranger Things for credits, which um, is very difficult to do from Netflix. Like you have to constantly whap it on the nose and say, no, I would like to listen to this music and watch these credits. Um, but yeah, man, dear Billy, folks, this is what TV is all about. Regardless of what my daughter tells you, Dear Billy is where it is at. Um, so, yeah. Uh, she wasn't worried about Max. We'll see if that stays through the whole season as we, as we talk about this. <laughs> did you have any other thoughts on this? Like, did you feel, if you didn't worry about Max, are the scenes where she's writing letters and she's feeling dreadful and, like, there's doom over her, did they not work as well if, you, if you're just not worried about Max is all? No, I really didn't think they had the guts to kill her. Guess what? They didn't. Um, but I wasn't worried about it. I was like, yeah, I really wanted to see like people open those letters anyway. Like I, I wanted okay. to see the reaction to the letters realistically. Okay. Um, but especially like the flashback scene, the flashback scene was really good because I always appreciate it when there's a nod to the seasons before the season you're watching. So like, it's a world, like, you know, it's a world and these things did happen, which is yeah. why I really like that they address that Max still has that trauma from watching Billy die because I don't want to just skip over that. It did happen. Yeah. Her whole season is a reflection on if, if we're being, if we're being like really complete about what her plot line is about is that she's she's vaguely like suicidal. Like that comes out from from Vecna in a couple of places and and especially at the end, spoiler alert in the spoiler section, you know, she says that she had sat in bed and wanted to die. Um and that's that's heavy stuff um in, in this capacity and and like kind of Max Max deciding she doesn't want to die is what makes one of the scenes in this season so strong. Yeah. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about what did you say they don't have the guts we'll talk about them not having the guts oh oh when, we get, to, when we get to chapter nine uh but yeah so chapter four i think is the highlight of the season to me you go forward and, and i i've described chapters five and six here we've got nina project and the dive as effectively taking a breath um they they stop or you think they've stopped they went through chapter four this was a really big deal and now we're going to cover 11. We're going to talk about her backstory at the Hawkins National Lab. And we're, we're going to reflect on what, what happened. And we're, we're going to take a breather. And I think that's actually a really good thing for uh, anything, a book, a movie, or a television show to do, which is, wow, that was intense, wasn't it, folks? Let's take a step back. Um, yeah. But in retrospect, I don't know that they took a step back as much as I thought they did. <laughs> no, they did not. Because the Nina Project, and as it turns out, the Hawkins National Laboratory story, maybe a little bit too coincidentally, depending on how mean you want to be about these things, is like the centerpiece of the season in terms of understanding what's happening, uh, right? And you don't know that. You think that this is something to get her powers back. Yay, fantastic. We do want her to have her powers back. But ultimately, hey, I've watched a movie before. I've played a video game before. I've seen an anime before. She's going to get her powers back. Whatever. It's fine. Um, now they do a cool thing here in terms of cleverness that I really like, which is, um, she's flashing back to her own past, but she's also not flashing back. She's actually experiencing it, which creates some like kind of weird beats and scenes. Cause she's trying to learn how to be a psychic again. Um, and I, I, I like that. Uh, but both of these kind of episodes feature things that kind of muddle together for me. So if you have anything that really stands out to you, Emily, just jump in on this stuff. Uh, but it's, where you start to get into uh, the Hellfire Club is a cult and demonic and Jason gets worried and Eddie yeah. is out there being hunted um, and Eleven's plot line is going forward here. I think you also have the California kids uh, yeah. bur burying a body. You have Will continuing to reflect on the fact uh, that it looks like he like likes Mike uh, rather than just likes Mike. Um, and, and we're getting more of those cues as we go forward. Um, and um, basically, they, they wind up in Utah uh, and they go and talk to uh, Dustin's girlfriend. Susie. I Susie, thank you. 
uh, about what it is that they can use with this information they got from the agent that was covering them in California. And then it will ultimately lead them to uh, the Nina Project, uh, which I believe is in Nevada. Um, and so you can kind of see how that's all going. Theirs is more, I would argue it's more perfunctory. They're, they're moving pieces on the board. Okay, they get this information, they get this information. And we know that they have to wind up with essentially getting 11. Uh, like we know, we could see that that's going to happen. Um, so that's what they're doing. And the rest of this is like well done set up, in my opinion, to, to get you to Chapter 7, The Massacre at Hawkins Lab. Emily, before we get to Chapter 7, which I know is one of your favorites, um, is there anything else from 5 and 6, Jason, D&D, Anything else that like jumps out at you other than kind of the setup for what's going to be the big reveal episode in chapter seven? Well, obviously Jason's whole thing was how he just makes speeches that are like, yeah, all these people died. Let's win a basketball game for them. Oh, isn't that the worst? That's in the no very first episode. Yeah. These He's people didn't die for us to lose the city's championship. It's like, oh my God. He sucks. Like, <laughs> I, he's so annoying on so many levels. Uh, yeah. You know, I really like the dive, but it, like I feel like the dive is more of a let's hint really, 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 really hard at the fact that Nancy still likes Steve. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of that going on. There's a number of things that are, hey, Nancy and Jonathan are on the outs. They're not, probably not going to work out. There's a plot line where Jonathan is no longer applying to the same college as Nancy. And basically everybody that's in the vicinity of either Nancy or Steve throughout are like, so you're totally into that other person, aren't you? Like every single scene. Uh, yeah. very funnily, Dustin and Steve talking about it in the car is is amusing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that that's, that's the purpose of that is a lot of hinting. Um, and realistically leading up into, you know how this works from Eleven's perspective in Nevada. You understand what's happening in California and then in Utah. You know what's going on, uh, relatively speaking, in Hawkins with Eddie and Jason uh, and the town there. Uh, and so that they're not as much of a step back as I, I said when I first watched them, but they are definitely transitionary episodes between Dear Billy and the massacre at Hawkins Lab. Yeah. The massacre at Hawkins Lab. So this is effectively the flashback that started off the season. And yeah, the one thing you know, is if you trust the storytellers, you trust the showrunners here, is that that's important, right? You mm -hmm. didn't just have that for no reason. Uh, and so, what they had been leading us to believe, even though you didn't necessarily have to buy it, uh, is that uh, at some point, Eleven in her past went crazy and killed all of her uh, co students and like some of the doctors uh, and people, everybody but Dr. Brenner, really, at Hawkins Lab. And understanding why that is, is part of the story. Also, in these past couple of episodes, which is probably what they also serve in terms of introduction, we have been introduced to what I believe the subtitles called The Orderly. Yeah, it's, it's just orderly. Okay. So. Which is the freakiest looking dude <laughs> you have ever seen. And you're like, you know, you stand out. Stranger Things, this isn't my first rodeo. Sir, you stand out in your uh, like ice cream man garb, talking all weird. Uh, and I think he's the first person that really interacts with Eleven when she's trying to figure out exactly how Project Nina works. Um, and she has to figure out, she has to say the same answers to like advance the videotape, <laughs> yeah. give or take. Uh, and, and you kind of get this feeling for this guy. And I, I can't remember which episode it's in, it might be the dive, where she's trying to do some psychic stuff with one of the psychic toys. And he tells her the story of, number one, because uh, she's 11, right? Um, and how uh, number one uh, was at the lab. And I recall this specifically because I have a habit of ruining things in terms of TV and movies and, and shows and whatnot. And, and my wife won't let me say what I'm thinking when I watch <laughs> shows. And I, I see that scene. And one of the things I'm thinking is, oh, yeah, that dude's totally number one. Uh, and I think we're talking in the postmortem after that episode, and I say, I, I have a theory, <laughs> and uh, but I don't want to share it with you because I'm pretty sure it's right. And uh, you make me share it with you, and then I think what you say is like, oh, yeah, definitely. Is that, am I remembering that correctly? 100%. They hint to this one. They don't tell us anything else. We have no knowledge of any of the children being one. There is literally nobody else in the building that we yeah. probably could have met. Yeah, so I mean, so so one of the things you could argue about this season, and I have seen this in reviews, is that it is 
at least a little bit predictable, right? Like, I think you're right. When we're realistically thinking about this, and we'll also think about it because he's going to get tied to the other character, obviously. There's, there's no one else that it could have been that would have been as satisfying. Um, and so it all, it all flows together, but it's also not the world's largest surprise. But, <laughs> but it's reliable. It's yes. not weird. Yeah, and we've talked about this before, right? Subversion of expectations, twists for the sake of twists. They can make stories bummers. They can not make sense. They're not fulfilling. Stranger Things 4, if you want to level a criticism at it, is pretty predictable. But you and I, and not everybody will agree, reasonable minds can differ, we say, right? Um, not everybody will agree, but you and I prefer you do the foreshadowing, you set up the Chekhov's gun, you play fair with the audience, and then those things, when you deliver on all of them, are still powerful, even if you can predict that the weird-looking dude that's only called orderly is actually Vecna. Yeah, well, <laughs> for sure. Uh, and I... I think that's important. Uh, and, and you're a little younger, so maybe the predictability that bothers some older, cynical, nihilistic folks won't bother you as much. Uh, but I like to keep that optimism, and I would prefer to have a good story well told rather than, oh my God, Joyce is Vecna? <laughs> right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, and that's how this goes as an episode, right? I, in terms of what happens here, the biggest thing by far is that there's a, the first exploration of the Upside Down, um, like the real long form exploration, the, the, the teenage version of these kids. I know they're all supposed to be teenagers, but versus the middle schoolers, the teenage versions of the, of the crew, go and explore the Upside Down. We learn about evil bats. Uh, we learn about uh, where they're congregating. We learn something really weird. And I want to know what you think about this, Emily, which is that the Upside Down is stuck in 1983. Oh, yeah. I like that. I mean, I'm obviously a fan of time travel. And after the Duffer Brothers didn't entirely screw up season four, I have good faith in them that they can actually handle time travel. Yeah. And you think that the, you think that this is a done deal. You think that time travel is entering the equation in season five? Listen, at the beginning, the start of this season, in Eleven's letter, she has this totally unnecessary part about how Joyce is saying that we're all time travelers in a way because, you know, the week is moving faster because she's so busy. Segue into diorama. But, like, it, it says time travel and it points out a thing about time travel. So I think, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Well, and of course, one of the things we will talk about when we talk about the grand finale is that when you create a situation that seems impossible to deal with, time travel is one of your options if you're a science fiction or fantasy show. Uh, and so we'll talk about that uh, towards the end. But but yes, I tend to agree that there are a lot of flags and a lot of hints that would suggest time travel might be in the offing here. Uh, and one of those is that when they explore the upside down, it is locked to a year that they are not in despite the fact that they can, in fact, communicate with the current year. So what exactly is happening with the Upside Down is an open question. Uh, it is stuck in a prior state, which may have to do with opening the original gate. All sorts of things could be going on there. But you do get that first exploration. You get a lot of visual effects. You get a lot of darkness. Sit in a dark room, folks, for, for these episodes. Yeah. Um, but uh, the predominant thing is you get... What is the equivalent of the, the James Bond villain monologue? You get, you get, I don't even know how long the last scene is, right? So oh, wow. Nancy gets captured by Vecna's visions. Vecna gives her the visions of like the Creel household. And uh, you come to the realization that in that Creel flashback, uh, Vecna, the bad dude, is actually Henry, the son uh, and so one of the things we had been dealing with in the series is like, well, how does this all work if the Upside Down isn't open yet? And as it turns out, Vecna or Henry is, is, is a bad egg. <laughs> he's, he's just an evil dude. Yeah. Um, and uh, Brenner finds him, starts his program based on him and uh, essentially captures him and, and gives him like an explosive or whatever else it was doing to keep his powers down and, and to keep him trapped. He convinces Eleven to release him and then in both Eleven's flashback and in Nancy's vision, we're getting the explanation of, of what was up with him. Yeah, I, I like this episode a lot, especially because you, throughout the entire season, probably because I asked you to, but you shared that you thought um, the orderly was uh, one who, who is 
now Henry and Vecna, but you share that with me. And even though like I knew it was coming and I knew that reveal was going to happen, they did it so well that yeah. it was still like a big thing. And I've said it before, but like, if it's predictable and you know it's going to come, that means it's reliable. And if you do it properly, it can still feel like a big reveal, even though you knew it was coming. You could still get the emotional beats. Absolutely. Right? Like, as soon as he asks her to remove the explosive or whatever, and, and it's so like, oh, if only this could be removed. And Eleven's like, wait. You're like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're watching this, and you're like, oh, I, I know that this isn't going to go well. This isn't exactly how it seems. Um, mm -hmm. Now, was I expecting her to wake up and like everybody was killed? No, I still didn't realize that that's what they had showed us in the first scene. So that's kind of me not paying enough attention to details, but it's still cool that way. And so, of course, the massacre at Hawkins Lab isn't Eleven, even though they would have been led us to believe that. It is Henry's and they have a face off in uh, the rainbow room. Uh, and it's one that Eleven ultimately wins and sends Henry to the Upside Down. And Henry sent to the Upside Down, we see him transform into Vecna, but we don't see a lot more from there. And that's because this the show is actually holding back a little bit uh, from us. Uh, but we do now know, going into the break, this is where the month existed between episodes, part one and part two, of Stranger Things, uh, that essentially the dude in both sections of the story, outside of Russia, we leave Russia to the side, uh, uh -huh. Uh, uh, in both sides of the story is the same person, and that's the main plot line for the show. And it feels really good, and it feels as you exit part one and head into part two that uh, you've got a bad guy. You know you want to beat him, um, and so you're ready for a month for the last two episodes to defeat him. Is that is that about right? What did, What were you thinking when the break hits, Emily? Well, obviously, I think it's a really, really, really good place to end it because it's kind of a breather because you know the last two episodes are going to be, all right, we're going to get prepped. We're going to fight this thing. That's what those two episodes are going to be. Even they're, though they're so long, it's going to be filled with character interactions. And realistically, they're just getting ready to fight the thing until they do. Um, and so when that break happened, I was just kind of excited, but also, I don't know, relieved maybe that there wasn't anything else to immediately be moving on to because you do need to kind of sit back and just think about what you witnessed and then analyze, well, maybe for us especially, what you've already seen <laughs> and then kind of try to figure out what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of fun there, right? I remember that month being like, oh, we totally saw Eddie's guitar. Oh um, yeah. We're totally going to have rock music. I remember finishing Dear Billy and being like, if music's the answer, we can do all sorts of fun stuff with music. And I actually don't think they went far enough with that, at least in this season, folks. Ooh. Uh, but uh, we saw the guitar. We knew something was going to happen. Now we deliberately didn't watch the trailer for part two because we don't, we don't watch those things. So we were having fun. I remember sitting at you at, the, at a restaurant and being like, what do you think could happen? And we talked about it for 40 minutes. And that's, that's some of the fun stuff you can have with, with storytelling and pop culture, it's one of the reasons that I do these kinds of things because it's awesome. Um, but yeah, it's a great place to finish off. You have your your monster in your sights. You understand that this dude is a bad egg. He likes to equate himself with a spider. He thinks humans are a scourge on the natural order. Uh, he's a real creeper. Um, and you finish chapter seven, you head into chapter eight. Uh, and this turns out to be exactly what you would think it was if you've been following along with like where the story is at, which is, uh, Eleven now powered up from having beaten uh, Henry in her memories uh, has the American army, which is not treated very well. Like it's not a positive image of this American army crew, a storm project, Nina. You have all sorts of issues with Dr. Brenner. You so you basically sort out the Dr. Brenner plot line in this uh, story where he essentially wants to be seen as a father figure. He gets in the way of Eleven leaving all this stuff. Ultimately he dies uh, and Eleven doesn't even give him the satisfaction of like kind of uh, giving him that emotional warmth that he's asking for. All while the Californians head over and go and rescue her and the Hawkins kids get armed. I love this episode so much. Yeah. What do you love about it the most? Well, I, I obviously love just them going to like the army store and just all of that. And then... Obviously, after that, Nancy sawing off the end of her gun, being uh -huh. like, yeah, I won't miss. And Jason sucks. And 
-hmm. Like it's just so fun and entertaining for me, at least. I love watching the setup to when we fight the thing, maybe even more than when we fight the thing. But sure. the end of the episode, especially, you know, when they're in the trailer and they all hop out and the music is playing, that's like my favorite shot, maybe my favorite part of season four. Yeah, was this your first uh, interaction with the uh, 80s rock band Journey uh, no. at the end of this episode, or you knew them a little bit? Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm, I didn't mean to impugn your musical knowledge. Uh, but yeah, so I think sometimes that's the case, right? Sometimes the, the darkest before the dawn, preparation for the siege, whatever it is, sometimes that's the best stuff. I mean, I know we've watched Two Towers before, but like everybody getting ready in Helm's Deep to get attacked sometimes gives you like the crunchiest emotional character beats. And I think there's a lot of that here. You have Eddie and Dustin kind of hanging out and wh whatever they're doing, prepping their uh, like spike garbage can lids. Yeah, that's fun. You have uh, Lucas and uh, Erica like trying to make, I think, spears. Yeah, it's spears. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and all that stuff, as you could tell that you could tell that the kids don't think that there's a high likelihood of success uh, on this whole plan and they're kind of getting ready for it. I, I think I think it's Robin that says something along the lines of, you know, we might not make it out of this one uh, or, or yeah, something that's like what, that. Robin's talking to Steve at the trailer and she says, so yeah, something along the lines of like, I don't think we're going to all survive this or something. Right. And, and, and that's good. Like, just like dear Billy, I, I think anytime you can actually take a situation where eh, probably everybody's going to be fine, give or take. And you can impart within it a sense of dread. Like, if you're an audience member and you really care about these people and like, wow, what is going to happen here? That I think that that's, I think that's, that's effective. And I tend to agree with you that very often the preparation is some of the funnest stuff, funnest, good word usage there, lawyer, um, so funnest stuff in, in watching a, a story like this, because at some level, emotionally, that's where the heroism lives. Right. When you're stuck in it and you're fighting bats and demon dogs and trying to survive and, and not choke against vines and things like you have to do whatever you're doing for survival instinct. But but choosing to actually put yourself in that situation, like that's where the big damn hero lives. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's I think that comes across in preparation episodes like this one. Some people would look at this and say, well, nothing happens in Hawkins. I mean, you have a Jason interaction you have you go to the. Yeah the ammo store and things like that. And I would say, no, this is where they decide that they're going to do this. Um, and, and that's a big deal. And I think that's why you get such strength from the ending because the yeah. ending is, you know, the final fantasy characters looking over the hill at the castle. It's all those comic book or anime shots of, I, I think at that point, primarily it's max with like a big old, like bug zapping lantern. Oh, I love the lanterns that they carry. And, and the crew looking at the haunted mansion house and saying, let's go as as journeys, like the weirdest version of Separate Ways ever. Uh, the greatest plays. version. <laughs> plays. And, and, and it's a prep episode. You get rid of the Dr. Brenner plot line. That's important. Eleven's going to bring it up with Vecna. You get some of the cool lines about what are we calling that guy now that we know more because Nancy knows more. Everybody knows more. So everybody's brought up to speed on information, which is important. I like it when they keep track of who knows what um, in these kinds of shows. And... Yeah, it's a preparation episode, but I think it's really good, especially when the piggyback Yay! is so long, so it's long. So great. It's so funny because you watch some of the final moments of like the climactic battle. And if you pause it at that point in time, you'll see that like there's 55 minutes left in the episode. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's like when Eleven goes to see Little Max and you pause there, it's like an hour and 30 minutes left or something. It is, it's crazy. It is absolutely crazy there. But it also has some really cool stuff in it, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think realistically, we're watching this show. We know what kind of show it is. We think we're gonna beat Vecna, right? Like eh, we're curious about the details. We're really curious about if anybody's gonna die. I know you were really worried about Steve. I, Steve Gray. Yeah, I know you love Steve. I know you were worried that he was going to pass. It was Steve or Eddie. <laughs> it was Steve or Eddie. Well, that's the interesting thing, right? Because we do look at things more analytically than some. And I remember sitting there with you between parts one and two and saying, Steve and Eddie kind of perform the same role in the group. Yeah. Um, it's kind of being a little bit uh, standoffish, a little bit older, funny, good relationship with, with the kids. Yeah. And both being friends with Dustin. 
Yeah. So I, I had said to you, you know, Steve's got some death flags on him because he's been eaten by the bats. And there's some shots in like episode, uh, I want to say seven, where he's like coughing. It's like, I'm sure it's nothing. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, okay, man. Um, and so it's like, I think only one of them is going to survive. As it turns out, that was in fact the case. Not before some other big yeah. <laughs> for, for some of our characters. Uh, but um, yeah, they, they come up with this plan, much like Stranger Things before. It's like elaborate. It's almost a Scooby-Doo or what I call a Save by the Bell plan. It's got all these phases. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to move on between here and there. We're going to talk to each other across worlds and dimensions. Um, but I think they do a good job of establishing what's happening there. Simultaneously, you have the Russian contingent escaping uh, the prison and then going back into the prison as they realize what we recognize as uh, the spider monster, whose name escapes me. I'm sure you'll tell me. The what mind flare? The mind flare, the particles, the particulate uh, is being kept in the Russian lab as they escape. Um, they realize that uh, there's problems in Hawkins. They kind of come to a bunch of kind of logical leaps. We allow it for these kinds of shows, but if anybody's going to be critical, you can you can point out that the the Russian team doesn't have great information uh, in terms of what's happening in Hawkins. <laughs> they ask for a pickup. It's a little bit not working, and they say we have to go back in and and destroy things. And it's like, yeah, okay, all right, Russia. Um, as it turns out, it appears to have been critical, but a eh, little a little circumstantial there. They're doing their own thing. And Team Hawkins slash Team Upside Down like plunges into action. And the biggest thing, my favorite thing about this is that Max, Max has to go and say, I'm going to be bait. Oh, I love, I love and hate Max's whole thing at the end there. Yeah. She says, I'm going to have to be bait. And, and when they're coming up with this plan, and this might also be in, in Papa, um, like this is all one kind of big four hour piece. Um, I'm going to be the bait is such a, it's such a heroic move, right? You have no idea what's going to happen. I'm going to turn off Kate Bush. I'm going to let him take me. And then she's talking to Lucas and he's like, I'm going to put the, I'm going to put the music back on as soon as you start like going. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. at the end of Papa in the back of the trailer. She says, I need to be the bait because he already has a handle on me and he'll try to take me as soon as he can. And then Lucas says, no, we can go back to the office. We can find somebody else. And then Max is like, no, we can't put that on a random person. I have to do this. Yeah. And that's just, that's such a, that's such a heroic moment um, uh, for her. And of course, Jason is going to make sure that there's no Kate Bush to put on. <sighs> <laughs> that made me so up. I think I phys like I yelled when he stepped on it. Oh, you did. You did viscerally re react. Well, it's such a weird bit. So let's talk about this a little bit in terms of like logistics. They're at the Creel household. Team Hawkins has like a lighting set up so that Team Upside Down can talk to them. Team Upside Down uh, is the teenagers who are going to go into the house and what they say flambe uh, Vecna. Uh, and Dustin and Eddie are going to distract the bats. We now know that there's like vampire bat things that are protecting the house. They're going to distract them. We don't quite know the specifics of that. They start boarding up the trailer where they're going to do it from. Uh, and this is where you get what's on your screen right now. You get Eddie rocking out to yeah. um, uh, master puppets. Uh, yep. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's a big scene. Uh, it's, it's big for him. That's what they're going to do. But in the real world, couple of things are happening one team california slash utah slash nevada realizes that they can't get to what they view as a battle happening in real time because 11 is now checking up on people and she sees max and team planning what they're planning um so they decide that they are going to quote unquote piggyback because when vecna goes into somebody's mind she can get into vecna's mind from that central mind and so she needs to get into a sensory deprivation chamber where you get some stuff we haven't even mentioned argyle uh, from our favorite pizza spinning, well, stoner, uh, who is going to get them a sensory deprivation chamber in a surfer boy pizza place while he cooks them up a delicious pie. Uh, and they're, they're going to have 11 participate in this battle from Nevada. And that's where everybody's at. But what I wanted to talk about from the real world is that Jason and his idiot crew attack Erica. <laughs> Yes, they do attack Erica. I know because she like punches him and she says crit hit and then runs away. Oh, I didn't catch that. I've only yeah. watched 
she says critical hit or, or crit hit. <laughs> yeah, it's crit hit. She like hits him and he falls down and she goes crit hit and runs away and grabs the flashlight. Natural 20. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that makes sense. But it's such a, it's so off-putting because she's, she's supposed to be 11, I think. Yeah. Uh, years old. Um, and she, she looks like 14 cause she probably is. That's fine. Uh, but it's like, you're, you're going to attack a little girl on this because you're looking for Eddie and you don't know what you see. They, they kind of accidentally figure out that there's blue light coming from the Creel house and Jason rolls in with a freaking gun. Um, and yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, it's a situation that is a little bit heightened. I think it's a little bit ridiculous, but I think the primary goal of all this was to break that tape recorder. Yeah, eliminate Kate Bush, essentially. And Jason is the best person to do that. Right, right. Because at this point, nobody likes him. He's too self-aggrandizing. He doesn't know what's going on. He projects that he understands what's going on, even though he saw someone float in midair and die. Yeah. Jason and still doesn't, like, absolve Eddie of this. Uh, so he's going he's gonna to be interacting with Lucas, who's trying to protect Max while Max is in the vision. Uh, Max has decided she can keep herself safe from Vecna with pleasant memories, which I believe you guessed correctly oh, in, yeah. in your head. You knew what memory it would be. Yeah, well, she said, like, I'm going to hide in good memory. I'm like, oh, it's a snowball. Yes, and you were pretty happy to see it, if I recall correctly. I love the snowball. It's one of my favorite things ever. So the basic plan is to distract the bats get Vecna where we know he will be. And in order to attack Max, he has to be in this specific place that they think they've identified from prior investigations of the Creel household. Get, get him where he needs to be. Max will deal with him in a safe space. They don't even know they have 11 on the team at that point in time. Max's plan starts to go awry. Uh, Eddie and Dustin's plan starts to go awry. And 11 shows up in Max's dream and starts fighting Vecna in earnest. Um, all these things are kind of simultaneous. So at that point, um, Dustin is thrown out of the upside down because that was the plan. Uh, Eddie stays in the upside down, decides not to run either because the bats are going to go through the hole, which I think they could have established a little better. And that might've been the reason, but he runs the bats outside the trailer. He gets attacked and then he's having bats swirl around him. Everything is escalating at this point in time. Eleven is attacking Vecna. Uh, Hopper and his crew are surviving in the prison that they've gone back into because the monsters have been let loose because the quote unquote shadow slash mind flare slash interdimensional spider is inside the other monsters. That's how the hive mind works. I think yeah. we're led to believe. Um, and so they're fighting their fight. All of this kind of culminates uh, as it, as it goes along. Uh, and when there are major issues in Russia, where Murray finally uh, kills all of the all of the monsters in the prison. What had been incapacitated teenagers are let loose. Eleven is able to fight against Vecna, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Before all of that, Vecna does another monologue because the, the guy loves a the, the guy loves a good speech uh. where, where he talks about the upside down, and we get perhaps one of our clearest beats of what this show is all about. Um, in its entirety, which is that when he shows up in the Upside Down, it isn't the Upside Down. It's kind of like an orange place. Yeah, upon thinking about it, since the boys call it the Veil of Shadows, yeah. I would say it's the Veil of Shadows pre-Upside Down, and then like Vecna slash Henry slash One makes it into the Upside Down. Okay, yeah, I think that's what happens, right? Because so what we see is, there is a demigorgon there. He's not like God. He didn't invent monsters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there's a demigorgon there. Demigorgon doesn't much care that he's walking around. So it's not like evil inherently or anything like that. Mm -hmm. He just discovers the mind flare and starts shaping it like when he drew a spider. Yeah. So this recontextualization of the entire series is that they thought the mind flare was behind it. They're not exactly wrong, but Henry Creel is controlling the mind flare or is at least using the mind flare as a tool. He builds the upside down. He has been and is who has been behind it all the whole time. Um, and that's, that's a big deal. And then you have some wonderful editing there where it's like, everybody's losing. You always like those. Everybody was losing parts. Um, and uh, Mike has his kind of now traditional Mike pep talk. 
Yep. <laughs> to to eleven, spurred on by Will, who is spurred on by Jonathan, who you know, it's it's a whole chain of pep talks um, that gets you to him saying, "Eleven, suck it up." I'm I'm, I'm sorry. No, it's, I love you. He says, "I love you." It's a big deal for her, uh, but it's it's predominantly, dude. You're stronger than him. What are you doing? Yep. <laughs> and uh, whether or not eleven is independently stronger than him, you have all these things start happening at once. You start having all, all these kind of wins. And they allow Eleven to, in kind of a weird, um, like, freeze frame, it goes black, and he's then, like, flying through the air. Um, and Eleven's got him. Uh, and then you get a weird beat that says, essentially, uh, you think you have won. <laughs> yeah. Uh, All of his monologues are like, you think you've won, but you can't. I will rule this world. This will be my new upside down. Like, you can never defeat me. And all the kids are just like, uh, sure. And then we're just kind of like, yeah, you can say that, but you're wrong. Yeah, this is totally like the villain's last stand. It's like, uh-huh. And I think even Eleven says directly, it's like, no, you're wrong. We've won. Yeah. Um, she says, and, no, you're wrong, and then shoves her hand in his face. Yeah. Yeah, he's, she's got her full hand out. She's in the typical Eleven pose. Uh, the teenagers have started to um, uh, throw Molotov cocktails at him. That's where you get uh, this wonderful shot, uh, which <laughs> is it really, really well done. Um, and also you get what can only be described as a Stranger Things times Kate Bush remix. Oh yeah. Where they, where they start running the Stranger Things music against running up that hill. Um, and you get like really cool music video type timings where it goes quiet and then it starts back up again when one of the Molotov cocktails hits. Uh, and, uh, at the same time, like he dissolves from the mind palace, uh, and you get Nancy with the shotgun looking like Sarah Connor or, or Ellen Ripley, or any of the other awesome 80s uh, female action heroes uh, knocking him out the window. And then things get a little weird. So that's where a traditional Stranger Things season would probably end. Uh, yeah. There's the monster. We came together. We, we looked like it was going badly for us, uh, but we fought him. Hopper also decapitates a Demogorgon on his side of the world. With a sword. With a sword. Looking like Conan the Barbarian the whole time. Uh, all this happens at once. It's all done to Kate Bush. It's all very epic. Uh, and then, well, uh, during all of this, Max had started to have her appendages broken. It uh, was terrible. It was horrible. It was so wonderfully done, and I hated it. <laughs> yeah, so she has her appendages broken. You really start to worry that they're actually going to kill her off right then. It was so uh, bad. When all this happens, where they get directly attacking uh, Vecna, she uh, falls to the floor. So she's in Lucas's arms, give or take. Vecna is thrown out the window. And then, well, Max starts to say she doesn't want to die. Uh, she's in Lucas's arms. Eleven gets kicked out of Vecna's brain, but is with Max's brain and is watching Lucas and Max uh, interact. Uh, and then um, it looks like we lose her. At the same time, the teens find out that Vecna's body isn't there. So as under Stranger Things, oh. Vecna's not dead. Um, and I believe it's at that point in time when the grandfather clock chimes. It's, it's the worst part. Max dies. You, it, It's like in between Max dying and then another cut of Max dying. You see everybody look out the window and Vecna's body isn't there. And then you cut away, like you zoom out from Max dying and then the clocks ring. And it's terrible because you haven't fully processed that yet. And they're just throwing another thing at you. They say, oh, actually, that was the fourth death. So now the world's going to get destroyed and your favorite character is dead. You have fun with that. Right. The kids had already determined that four deaths was what Vecna needed. And I'm also forgetting a beat because they also run uh, another quiet song during this. Eddie dies from his wounds against the bats, um, tells Dustin to look after the sheep. Dustin Dustin crying is like the worst thing. It is, it is very emotional. It's uh, terrible. It's all yeah. horrible. So you've, you've beaten Vecna, you get the awesome Kate Bush song, and then they immediately switch emotional tones. And you're still reeling when the clock starts chiming. And all hell breaks loose, quite literally. Yeah. Um, so as they had posited, the gates can be opened up. This is designed to um, allow Vecna into their world. The gates open up, and and with one exception, which is that the gate in the Creel household immediately eviscerates, vulcanizes, and just destroys Jason. Yeah, good riddance. Who's who it's in front of. 
Um, they start to connect, combine, and you watch Hawkins like explode. Uh, you watch all of these buildings fall apart. You see all of the different gates connect, and you realize at a fundamental level uh, that the team lost. Uh, like like the team lost what they were trying to do. Vecna's not dead. The the gates are opening up. Uh, Max has to have died in terms of psychologically for the chime to have gone off. Uh, Vecna, when he was giving his speech, knew that she had sustained enough wounds to die. That's why he's gloating in that scene. And you don't even know how to react. And the, the soundtrack in that particular scene is fantastic because it's composed of like clock noises uh, as as all this is happening. Uh, and then it's it's horrible and also fantastic. Like I think, wow, they went for it. They went for the Empire Strikes Back. They went for the loss of the good guys, which made sense in retrospect because you knew that season four and season five had been planned together and they said season five would be the last season. Um, but you're still like, wow, I can't believe they went this far. Mm. And then they chicken out a little bit. Yeah, you know what they do? They say, no, Max isn't dead. She's just in a coma. How dare you? You killed her. She is dead. So if they revive her, they can't kill her again because why would you kill her again? She was almost already dead. So if they revive her, they can't do that. If they don't revive her, then she is dead. Why did you put her in a coma? And if they don't revive her and she's just in a coma, is it going to be a search for Max? But then if they do find Max, then she won't be able to die again. <laughs> You're pretty good at rants, you know that? Oh, I've... I've, I've been told. Uh, you've given some thought to this, I think, too. Oh, so, much thought. Yeah, so Eleven basically says, no, I'm not going to let you die, and starts doing some psychic stuff. And we really don't see that scene resolved because we move into the season's epilogue. And one of the things that Emily and I have always really liked about season uh, Stranger Things is that they do an epilogue. It's kind of structured as a novel. Uh, yeah. And so they do kind of a first season is them at Christmas, and you see what happened with Nancy and Jonathan and Steve, and you go through that. The snowball is the epilogue of season two. Yeah, Those yeah. kinds of things. Uh, season three's epilogue is just sad because it's the Hopper letter, I believe. Um, it's but so depressing. It's <laughs> hugs the Wheelers because they're leaving. Eleven recites Hop or Hopper, I guess, recites Hopper's sad letter. Eleven is crying. Everybody says goodbye. Max is sad in her bedroom. Then we're done. Right. Well, and so that's the end of season three. And then season four takes a different approach. So it says two days later, this was the time it would take for the car to get from Nevada, from the Nevada team, back to Hawkins, Indiana. And as we start the scene, it's unclear like whether that was, I, it's so strong. It's such a big deal, like Hawkins dissolving on itself. They're like, was that real? Was that a dream? What happened when Eleven did something to Max? Did it get restored? And you immediately get kind of notions that that isn't what happened. You get the cars going the opposite direction. You get the team oh, from the hated, coming into town. I hated the cars going the opposite direction because that's like the first thing we see. And the second they do the cars going the opposite direction, I know Hawkins is on fire. Everyone's leaving. Something bad happened. And I didn't want that because I like Hawkins and I wanted everything to be normal. And I wanted us to have our normal, you know, high school drama at the beginning of the top, the top of the next season. But you just see these cars rolling away and you have this overcome feeling of dread. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. It's the it's the first scene that they say, no, this is real. Uh, and then you start to get some of the news broadcasts. Uh, uh, one, I'll, I'll let you get to it in a second. One <laughs> says that this was an earthquake. Uh, and then two talks about the Munson murders. The Munson murders, because the people were magically lifted into the air and had their eyes poked out. Obviously, Eddie could have been in all of those places at all of those times. And it was obviously all Eddie's fault. Eddie did all of it with his band of cult friends. Obviously, it's him and a bunch of children. I know this really bothers you as a plot beat. I think that makes it a good one. Yeah. Uh, but, but I'm not... But I'm not sure. So, yes, uh, Emily has been uh, historically bothered uh, by what is uh, one of my uh, least favorite bits of, of narrative. Uh, least favorite meaning it always bothers me, much like it bothers her uh, in that, uh, you know, that's, it's that superhero story where Spider-Man is blamed for whatever happened. Or in this case, Eddie, who basically helps save the day, is on the team that saves he, the, the world, give life. or take. He sacrificed his life for this. Yes, he sacrificed his life. I don't know whether they actually saved anything. We'll talk about that in a second. But he at least delayed it. He helped the he helped the team, and 
Uh, yeah, they're blaming all the murders on him. Now, they're also blaming the Hellfire Club, which is at least interesting because they know who's in the Hellfire Club. And it doesn't seem like the Wheelers or anybody is getting a, a lot of uh, back talk about it. Uh, but yeah, what we get for the epilogue is kind of typical epilogue stuff where the characters are at. Um, we see them go to kind of the, uh, the charity uh, safety folks for people who lost their house, uh, making sandwiches, putting food together, um, and otherwise doing those kinds of things. We see kind of a reconciliation. We see the one that we've been waiting for between Eleven and Hopper, uh, who have some really fun interactions about them both being bald uh, at that point in the plot line. Uh, and we get some kind of premonition type stuff. We, we have a conversation between Mike and Will where Mike says, you know, she's never lost like this. Eleven has never lost a battle like this one. I don't know how she's going to react. Um, and it's a lot of good character building scenes, not a lot of plot stuff uh, necessarily, uh, but you do get confirmation that the city is, is not great. It doesn't appear quite as lava filled as it did uh, that night. So we don't quite know what's happening. And you also get confirmation that Max is alive. No. In a, in a coma. That said, you do have some interesting edits even there where Eleven tries to go into her brain. They they kind of edit away from that back to another scene and then go back to that attempt later on in the epilogue here, which runs the length of a normal episode of another TV show for the record. <laughs> and uh, then you discover that Max isn't there. Like we haven't seen Eleven go into a brain and just not have the person there at all. That, that Max is not in her brain, uh, at least as Eleven goes to visit it and you wonder exactly what's happening here. Uh, with respect to Max. But I think Emily and I are both in agreement that it's it was probably worthwhile to kill her right there. I love Max. I love Sadie Sink. Uh, but I, I don't know that kind of winding back on that decision helps their narrative. Oh. No. Yeah. And, and so I don't know where they're going with that. We also have a working theory that the very end is maybe her dying. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, that leads into... What I think you told me was the first playing of like the Stranger Things title music. Yeah, in, so in the show. Yeah, so they played the title music obviously at the top or mid front of every Stranger Things episode, but they use it like in I don't know with the Kate Bush music a little bit earlier, but not really. It's like more just normal. It's remix, sing. yeah. Yeah, but like this, I think is the first time in the series that we've actually heard like the full Stranger Things start theme used for an actual scene, like like something yeah. that and that scene is pretty ominous. The very yeah. last the very last sequence of season four is Will touching the back of his neck. Welcome back to Hawkins, Will. I hope you got I hope you like touching the back of your neck because that's your go-to move. <laughs> um and he touches the back of his neck. The Stranger Thing music plays and then like there's like a tremendous pollen outburst in Hawkins or something. Like, I think we're just really worried about the pollen levels or, or, or something uh, in Indiana. But no, just kidding. It's the upside down. The stuff that's been floating in the upside down every time we visited it, every time that it's otherwise come through, uh, is floating through the scene. And then you get one, perhaps my favorite bit of music in Stranger Things history in terms of like their own scoring, where they take the Stranger Things theme and they build into this kind of, epic melancholy what in the world's going on kind of symphonic tune that reminded me and i don't know if you remember this emily of the opening scene to uh part one of harry potter and the deathly hollows when the, the kids have decided that they have to go after voldemort uh, and they're obliviating their parents um and if you go back to that scene you'll get this kind of same kind of trumpety music about like we have a mission to go on all hell has broken loose and we have to go forward with this drive. Um, and this last bit of music, which features all of our main characters looking out the windows, looking into the sky as the upside down arrives in Hawkins and finishes with this absolutely crazy shot yeah. of everybody looking at hell coming to earth um, is, is such a powerful and evocative finish. And I know that some people actually complained about it to me that said, oh, I felt like a cliffhanger. Like it, it felt like it didn't have an ending. And I think, I think season four had an ending. I think like they battled Vecna, yeah. they, they went through all that. And then the epilogue says, well, 
Would you like a preview of season five? Give yeah, some- no. Season four is supposed to lead into season five. Season four has an ending, but this is season four's connection to season five. Like a good book that's in a book series, the book ends, you solve the book's problem, and then it has sort of a kind of cliffhanger thing that will lead you into the next book. So you have something to start with. Yeah, I, I tend to agree on that. It certainly wasn't a problem for me, and I remember watching this. And again, I, music is so important to me that I highly recommend anybody check out even just the musical cue from when Will touches his neck to this shot. Uh, it is as good as any musical cue in a movie, in, in my opinion. So good for you, whoever actually scored that. Um, but uh, it's it's incredible to actually watch what was very specifically a kind of kids show um, and still is. Uh graduate into actual serious consequences. This is going to be real. Um, And the only thing I would add to that is I do know that you have a little bit of a concern, Emily, and you mentioned it earlier while we were making this video. Um, What's going to happen in season five? Like, are we going to get any of the beats that we like about anything in, in the normal world? It doesn't seem like we can with this setup. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think they, can't like physically it's not going to be the same they can probably do a relatively the same kind of thing like i don't think they're going to throw us in the deep end with all right how do we fight this thing right now i think it's going to be more of a slow gradual thing into how are we going to defeat this thing right now but at first i feel as though it's going to be all right let's gather everyone up make sure everything is working properly and everyone's okay. And then we're gonna try to figure out how to do this thing. And I am kind of concerned about five because they've hinted very, I think in my opinion, at least very heavily at time travel and Max isn't quite dead yet. And I don't want the time travel to undo everybody else's death. I know specifically, I've said this to you a few times, dad, but I the deaths are so powerful And I don't want them, everyone who's dead, to just come back because of time travel. I can definitely see that. I can see that being a concern. I don't think they would do that. Although there would be at least a pull towards like the super happy ending version. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, the reason we were talking about time travel is, as I mentioned earlier, we were talking about the fact that this seems pretty irreconcilable. (laughs) You know, that's a that's a big lava crevice in the middle of Indiana. None of this looks like it's going to be easy to fix. Uh, and so one of the things you do see is time travel. Obviously, the biggest and most prominent example of that is Endgame. Uh, and certainly, if Stranger Things wanted to run a time travel season five plot, the biggest concern I would have from a narrative side is that you got to try to avoid doing a time heist. You got to try to avoid feeling exactly like Endgame. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying that they take up all the air in the room. I think you could still do one of those things and, and have a good time with it. Uh, but I think you do have to be wary of one of the biggest pop culture phenomenons had a time heist in it. Um, and so you wouldn't want to just be seen as copying that. Uh, that would be my primary concern. Otherwise, I think this is I think this is bold. Uh, I think this is incredible. I was worried that Stranger Things would essentially just be copies of itself to ever diminishing returns. And season four was completely not that. Uh, and I am so thrilled about them recontextualizing a series that I already enjoyed, making it even stronger, that the kid actors have all gotten better um, than when they started. Uh, and I got to experience it all with my daughter who loves it more than me. Um, yeah. so Stranger Things 4, I highly recommend it. I can't lend Emily out to watch it with you. Uh, but if you have an Emily in your life, I highly recommend watching it with them because it's a lot of fun to see actual physical reactions to things <laughs> like oh, the tape recorder breaking uh, or, or whatnot as, as you watch these things. So, uh, Emily, I, any parting words on this? We've reached the end, much like our characters in Hawkins have. Um, do you have any other thoughts for Stranger Things 4? Do you have any other thoughts on doing a postmortem with me here in video form? You like this? You enjoy this? You're going you're gonna to come back and do it again? I mean, I'll do it again if we have something fun to do it on. <laughs> and Stranger Things 4 is, is the kind of thing that is fun to do it on, right? Yeah. All right. Well, folks, thank you for hanging out with us for almost two hours. I hope you enjoyed this. We obviously love Stranger Things 4. Leave your comments. Be gentle to my daughter. This is her very first time on the internet. Uh, but Emily, I just want to say thank you. I absolutely love having these conversations with you. Uh, and I can't wait to do it again. Bye, everybody.